Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening and welcome. I'm Yohei Igarashi, Acting Director of Academic Affairs at the Yukon Humanities Institute, where I also direct the Digital Humanities and Media Studies Initiative. Um, and today's talk is part of that initiative. Um, before we begin, I wanted to thank the Asian and Asian American Studies Institute for co-sponsoring tonight's event. And also thanks to our postdoctoral research associate, Elizabeth Delazazara, who's also here on the Zoom helping out um, with this event. Tonight, um, I'm thrilled to introduce Professor Xiaoling Ma, who is an assistant professor of humanities specializing in literature at Yale and US College. She was born in Taiwan, grew up in Singapore, and spent 10 years in the US where she uh, got her PhD at the University of Southern California in Comp Lit. Um, she subsequently taught at Penn State University. Uh, Professor Ma's interests include literary and critical theory, media studies, and global Chinese literature, film, and art. She has published in academic journals such as Configurations, Mediations, and Positions. They all have the same suffix. <laughs> um, her first book manuscript, The Stone and the Wireless, Mediating China, 1861 to 1906, is forthcoming this year, uh, this May, I believe, with Duke University Press as part of its sign storage and transmission series. Um, and just quickly, that's one of the leading media studies book series um, and a really fantastic, I'm always putting out fantastic books. Um, if you have any questions for Professor Ma, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom window. Thank you all for joining us this evening, and let me turn things over to Professor Ma. Thank you so much, Yohei, and thank you, Elizabeth, too. I really am really grateful to uh, Yohei's kind invitation and the University of Connecticut's Humanities Institute for their invitation. Um, the whole, you know, process has been very smooth and I'm delighted to be here and thank you for um, pushing back your dinner for me. So I'm going to start by talking about aspects of the book that have lingered with me and um, save the last few minutes of the talk for the second project. So a Chinese ambassador in London in the late 19th century describes the phonograph in somewhat telephonic terms. And this confusion really tests the efficiency of his own diplomatic record as an English scriptive medium. In another scenario, a low bureaucrat copies from a stone inscription, the very science fiction novel in which he, along with other characters, have attempted to process the information overload of an idealized technocratic China. Third scenario, at the height of infrastructural destructions during the Boxer Rebellion of 1900, letters, phonographs, telegrams paradoxically delivered the message of communicative breakdowns. The Stone and the Wireless stages these scenes around existing, but also more figurative notions of communicative media from print, phonographs, human steely hybrids, feminine sentimentality, brain electricity, shamanistic rituals and early cinema, and ask what is it exactly that these media do? What do media do? Over the last few decades of the Manchu Qing dynasty, writers, intellectuals, reformers grappled with this question without knowing they were doing so. They did not know so because like the English word uh, media, the Chinese term mei ti or mei jie, referring to technical media, did not exist till after the early 20th century. So here you can see kind of excerpts from the popular press around that time, uh, referring to the typewriter and the phonograph, all just in terms of some kind of machine in general. So ji qi or ji qi. 
media do not mediate between this and that thing, between entities, processes, individuals and collectives, the mythical and the scientific, to just give a few examples, without first mediating mediation itself. That's to say, a medium always mediates between some version of its already mediated form as a discursive representation in text or images, and the um, apparently unmediated technical process or device. The book is a study of late 19th and early 20th century Chinese media culture and a theoretical inquiry into mediation. So I guess the first kind of methodological um, um, discovery that I made was that there is a coincidence in scholarship between an attention to media forms, that is the physical devices and the technical processes. And this, you know, we associate with a kind of post hermeneutic turn, but also really the, the work of Lev Monovich, right, with his attention to uh, a kind of media formalism, if you like. And on the other hand, you have a resurgence of um, kind of a, attention in literary and aesthetic forms. And I kind of want to pull the two opposing strands together. So the first homeneutic uh, attention to technical devices on the one hand, and the kind of return or resurgence of aesthetic formalism or literary formalism. So there are media forms on the one hand, and there are forms of media on the other. And you can think of forms of media as the tones and metaphors and tropes, composition, all the, all the things through which um, machines and communicative machines come to be represented. So the problem is not that there has been too much focus on media devices or objects and not enough mediation or vice versa, but that the two have not been sufficiently assimilated. And the rift is especially evident in my field of study. In, in the context of the late Qing, you have a lot of um, calls to look at social mediation, right? To look at mediative processes between language, culture, social economic, politics, and also in, in the international realm in this last few decades of the Manchu Empire without bringing these inquiries of social mediation into the study of technical media. So the project started when I was interested in asking what we would find if we revisit this period of the late Qing, where there's so many kind of upheavals in terms of political, social, and epistemology, what will happen to this period if we look at it through the perspective of technical media, but also vice versa, how media theory would look through the lens of late Qing China. By arguing that the processes of mediation, the social processes of mediation are inseparable from mechanical innovations in communications, I was trying to bring the kind of post hermeneutic and the hermeneutic attention to form together and look at this as a media question in and of itself. But of course, there are many, many obstacles in the way. And this is one big uh, omission that I often want like to share with students or undergrads is my historical sources <clears throat> grasp what media did without knowing what media were. They didn't have a term for it. <clears throat> I, on the other hand, as a struggling media studies scholar, was bent on searching for media through original lexicons in Chinese, through different uh, play of words, when the, history, when the question of what do media do was right in front of me all along. <clears throat> and what do I mean by that? Very simply put, media record, media transmit, and media seek to interconnect and connect. So these three terms, recordings, transmissions, interconnectivity, became the headings with which I organized the book's five chapters. Now, it's then also interesting that G Chuan or Zhuan, the second is a kind of um, a polyphonic word, and the third term, Tong, which means interconnectivity, they also stand for the written records of genre, uh, or genres of records, biographies, and dynastic histories, respectively. 
So my book then explicitly embodied the tension between technical functions on the one hand and discursive representations on the other in its organizational structure as well as heuristics. With each chapter under these headings then, the book traces a range of mediations between constructive significations and technological embodiments. And I'll turn it, I, I alternate between non-fictional and fictional genres in order to foreground the mutual interactions between forms, historical meanings, and technical media, both real and imagined. If media mediate, then Chinese media, or you can substitute China for any other terms, Latin America, um, European, American, Chinese media must mediate then between China and what it considers as its outside. One of the main areas for revision that I received from my book report, uh, reader's report, was, well, why Leiqing China? And it's actually something that Asian studies scholars get a lot, and I have received that in various forms. Why media and mediation in China? So there are two parts to this question. One is historical, and that's relatively straightforward to map. So the years 1861 to 1906 marked the time when, um, when new technologies, when old so-called old technologies like the phonograph and the telephone, the telegraph were new and foreign, not just new, but definitely foreign. And they were enthusiastically documented by print, but with a lot of controversy. So photography, for instance, uh, is said to begin in China when uh, Frenchman Jules Enfant's Eugene Altier's employment uh, with the Chinese Customs Service uh, started between about 1843 to 1846. So during that time, he brought photography to China. Um, but as a Canton mathematician, Zhou Boqi actually contested, he did invent the camera, uh, kind of a in indigenous version in 1844. With cinema, scholars of the point to August 1896, the Xi Garden screening as the origin of Chinese cinema, although disagreements over what cinema actually translated into could really take this history back earlier with reports of lantern slide screenings from as early as 1875. Right? So you have all these controversies about when these um, new media actually really began in China, and uh, you can we can say the same for the telegraph and the phonograph as well. So the history of media, perhaps even more so than other histories, directly concerns who reported what, when, and through which specific medium. Mediation then does not just name the object of one study, but also one's concept. And here, this is when the question of why China becomes a conceptual one, or already is always a conceptual one. The question of why China then has also to be addressed in tandem with why theory. Mediation defined throughout this book as media's cleaving and bridging of techniques and signification applies just as vigorously, I argue, to the rifts and unions of history and concept. The history concept problem, as Rebecca Carl observed, is always welded, at least in Chinese studies, to the another binary, which is nativist versus foreign, China versus the West or um, the international realm. A work like The Stone and the Wireless, which have chosen to take mediation as its object as well as method of study, really have to struggle between historicizing the then new media and also conceptualize and justify mediation for rethinking the late 19th century um, Chinese uh, milieu. Because if uncovering media cultures outside of Europe and North America valiantly expands disciplinary horizons to kind of want to dust off some cultures with a theoretical brush really invite allegations of parochialism of a specific kind. And here, point two, I have to go back, kind of travel back in time to a rather foundational text in my field of study, <clears throat> which is Zhang Longxi's um, 1992 essay published in Critical Inquiry. Now in this piece, 
he um, really prominently foreground the binary of Chinese reality versus Western theory. Responding to Ray Charles' reduction of the 1989 Tiananmen incident, that is Chinese reality, to how American television represented it, without going into the historical specificities of the protesters' demands and uh, brutality of the Chinese state, um, Zhang was arguing that this elision of historical reality came at the cost of Western theory. So even though Zhang Sese was not focusing on media, he actually raises the possibility of thinking about American television, uh, not just as mere fictional representation, but also something that's worldly and circumstantial. In so doing, the essay inadvertently wedges technical media between Western theory and its competing Chinese reality. Television's worldliness and circumstantiality, according to Zhang, ought to amplify Chinese reality. It ought to urge uh, theorists to talk about history. Yet, again, according to Zhang, being deployed for a critic's fictional representation, television ends up buttressing Western theory instead. Now, well, this um, 1992 debate, which, you know, uh, of course, invited further response from Chow, is suggesting is if we can accept the mediatedness of Chinese or any other reality, while simultaneously considering media's concrete historicity and materiality, could the West and China not then be unhinged from their tortured gridlock with theory and reality, respectively? If such an unmooring is possible, surely even the relatively straightforward task of historicizing media becomes an eminent theorizing of what media do. As long as the West continues to have a monopoly over the term theory and the non-West uh, continues to be relegated to the realm of practice or history or context, so on and so forth, we will never kind of reconcile the animosity between these pairs, no matter how many times we put them in square quotes, as I have. And many critics have um, tried to kind of unhinge the lock, right? Han Saucy, for one, suggests that since deconstruction's fantasies of China are so foundational for deconstruction's history as theory or method, it was Chinese theory that modifies Western reality. But Saucy and other kind of post-structuralist inflected scholars are really not the first to suggest this unhinging of theory, of history, of Chineseness and Westerners. Qing reformers, I suggest, nearly two centuries before, unwittingly performed this unlocking or what Saucy calls the chiasmus on the predicates of what will only later be verified in North American academia as text versus context, Western theory versus Chinese reality. And what do I mean by that? So after the second Opium War, when China lost, um, there's the self-strengthening movement between 1861 to 1895 um, came up with this um, movement to really borrow Western technologies, <clears throat> hire Western engineers, build all these arsenals in the coastal cities, and so on and so forth. And you can see some of their um, achievements there. Now, in hindsight, uh, the movement failed <clears throat> and a lot of the historical verdict has been that they can't just borrow Western science and technology without also reforming China as a whole, right? So despite all these uh, historical verdicts on what was called, what would, would be labeled as China's failed modernity and so on and so forth, um, what I want to focus on today is their kind of a slogan or their most well-known um, call, which is to call for Chinese learning as essence and Western learning as practical use. This remarkably previews this idea of Chinese reality and versus and Western theory that Zhang Luoshi first proposed in 1992. Now, the essence of um, Chinese essence as foundation and Western learning as theory, uh, sorry, as practice, I have um, 
unlock the terms too much. It really can be traced to Feng Guifeng, one of the original authors of the movement, whom in his 1898 essay popularized the distinction between Western Chinese learning and subsequently this uh, Feng Guifeng's kind of um, principle was picked up by other reformers of the movement. Now in, in this kind of systemic structure, you're not supposed to mix Western science and technology with Chinese Confucian precepts. You're also not supposed to mix uh, Western philosophy or their kind of foundational precepts with their uh, practice, which is science and technology as well. So what happens with this kind of uh, very struggled um, structural division was a kind of strange epistemology produced out of a real politic, of course. And it was neither really foreign or indigenous, uh, but it was historical and semi-colonial enmeshment of both. So to kind of just give you a view of these historical distinctions that the self-strengthening movement reformers were making is not to harp on them, neither is it to now render them useless or simply unstable in deconstruction parlance, but I want to say that to historicize distinctions is really to make their usage more precise. Of course, there are imperfect um, equivalents that I'm making between what was Chinese precepts, Confucian precepts, and the academic high speak of theory. Nor am I suggesting that this idea of Western science and technology, as you see in the pictures, is the same as what we're calling <clears throat> practice or historical contextuality. But what is considered foundational abstract knowledge precisely rubs against practical functionality. And the two, moreover, are sharpened on the backs of political rivalry and linguistic cultural difference. What I want to emphasize is that this was the Chinese reality or context. Later day observance of the gap between Western theory and Chinese reality, and I do consider myself as one, can thus learn a lesson or two from the above episode of Qing intellectual history. That is, the distance separating any theory from any reality is indeed historical through and through. When the historical context in question orders the very terms in opposition, the question that confronts us becomes whose theory, whose reality? The road to an eminently media inquiry where media announces both the historical object and method of study <clears throat> does not have to lead to China, but it might well start there. The turn of the 20th century more than denotes a period when old technologies were new and foreign, but also a time when writers and intellectuals were struggling to demarcate machines and technical know-how from what was perceived to be the fundamental and yet more nebulous roots of their identity. After the self-strengthening movement failed, more progressive reformers sought to renew the Qing state by turning to the West, not just for technology, but also for cultural and institutional change. Hence, we have Yan Fu, who attributed Western supremacy to educational reforms and commitment to social and political justice. And then you also have Zhou Shuren, better known as Lu Xun, who mocked his countrymen for clamoring over Western material achievements, such as the most advanced weaponry, steel, and railways, instead of valuing a spiritual emphasis on the individual. It's unclear, however, who had the last laugh. Yin Fu and Lu Xun's criticisms of their intellectual predecessors still play on a kind of incipient division between the yet uncodified disciplines of science versus humanities. The case of mediating China is also the case of periodization of concept and period, but also the now we see of disciplinary formation. Beyond their immediate political and social concerns, Lei Qing intellectuals prefigure C.P. Snow's 1959 critique of the divisions between two cultures and recently modestly reframed in Bruno Latour's work. Challenging the dichotomy between science and technology and culture, Latour not insignificantly called those who walk the narrow path between the two, 
between the West and other cultures, mediators, and the uncharted territory between the strictly modern and the postmodern perspective, the Middle Kingdom. These are workplace, and I will return to comment on why I harp on them. And indeed, they are both human and non-human mediators in the so-called Middle Kingdom, and they star as this book's protagonist. The diplomats Guo Song Tao and Liu Shi Hong, and the technical contraptions they imperfectly record in their diaries are in chapter one. Jia Bao used time travels inscribed on stone, figure in chapter two. Cho Jing, the feminist um, and nationalist martyr, versus her verses, her photographs, her dressing in chapter three. The boxes in chapter four with their incantations and pulled out telegraph poles. And the uprising entrepreneur of biomediatic technology in chapter five. They are, they are all mediators in the strongest sense of the word because they actively negotiate this thin line separating technology and culture, reform and rebellion, China and the world, gender differences, all these boundaries that were made possible by developments in transportation networks, as well as inscriptive print and early audiovisual wireless media. In so far as these mediators also evoke yet to be invented processes and networks, this book thinks the primordial stone still lay alongside the wireless. She resistance against associating Western theory a la Latour with Chinese reality presents itself again. It does so by ignoring that Western technological transfers coupled with what is considered as Chinese or indigenous were part and parcel of that reality. The field of Chinese histories of science and technology has debunked the neat term paradigm uh, postulating the absence of modern science in imperial China and done really incredible work looking at the kind of advancements of um, Chinese techno science as active. And yet, without mobilizing specifically media technologies to rethink the convergence between science, society, and politics, is both puzzling and remiss. Mediatory processes did not just happen frequently during the late Qing. The late Qing men and women also avidly grafted mediation onto their encounters with innovations in recording communications. As John Gilroy demonstrates, theories of mediation as expounded by German idealism, but also really in Raymond Williams' work in cultural uh, materialism, have been insufficiently assimilated into the study of actually existing media. If this estrangement is due to disciplinary divides, no doubt the rift is even more pronounced when we have disciplinary divides coupled with national, racial, cultural, linguistic differences. The mediators I examine integrate the discursive processes of mediations between China and the West, essence and function, and other oppositional terms into what it is that a technical medium does, quite literally. Here, you must have recalled that with the plethora of terms media, mediate, mediations, mediators, and now the Middle Kingdom, I'm quite fond of the literal. So this maybe is my other side note or method besides the earlier one on uh, media formalism and aesthetic form is that uh, my book, in a way, also contribute to current debates about the literal and surface reading and critique and post critique. So to persist in the doings of media, to persistently ask what do media do, perhaps follow a strain of uh, Louis Althusser's determination to read Marx's capital, quote, to the letter, with an effect of producing critical puns, paradoxes, ironies, and oxymorons. In one chapter of the book, for example, I literally follow the description of a very banal scene of um, characters taking, discussing how to transport books back in their book cart and what kind of cart, whether they should take a three barrel wheel, 
wheelbarrow or two wheel carts and so on and so forth. Really banal description of the cart, but actually um, take that to kind of relate it to the Chinese term of um, the transportation of knowledge, right? And what that means for uh, the means and differentiation. There's indeed something very literal about my repetitive use of media, mediation, and varieties of forms, something plottingly obvious about emphasizing the commonality shared by media forms and forms of media. But such play on words arises from a commitment to and not an accident of reading. Such a play of words make a formal demand on readers to open themselves to a more materialist experience of language. Accordingly, readers may find my dogged pursuit of communicative devices and processes reminiscent and yet strangely at odds with surface reading. So you have this idea that uh, pushing back against symptomatic reading, surface reading actually reappreciates text at face value. And Kenneth Schmitz make this really um, important remark that what envisages in plain sight also must escape notice, or there will be no job for us to do. And following kind of Schmidt's um, suggestion, I, I do want to avoid the binary of surface and depth and instead really prioritize the slippages between the literal and the figurative um, when I look at what count, count as media. So that's my kind of uh, second quip about method. To go back to the Lei Qing or the historical context, my media, media theorists, all the Lei Qing men and women, I really consider them as media theorists before their time. And there is a kind of out of time or asynchronous movement of this book that I want to end by suggesting. It is awkwardly placed, this book situated in China between 1861 and 1906. It's awkwardly placed between in existing media histories that start often earlier in the, in the 20th century, or even in political and literary studies focus on the last decades of the late Qing. It lurks rather as footnotes to the more ostentatious parades of the new, and if so, I do want it to be so. With my study ending in the year 1906, I stopped before the Xinhai Revolution of 1911, before the 1914 May 4th movement, when the Chinese language was reformed properly, before the serious beginnings of Chinese film and gramophone industries in the 1930s, before the centralization of telecommunications network in the Republican era, and before, as we all know, the fervent transnational imagination of the Chinese typewriter during the interwar and post-war years. The Stone and the Wireless closes before these mo moments so as to capture the manifold unpredictable potentials of media mediation before, as we now say, go live. In addition to the nameless boxes, random photograph men and women and unknown artists, I've chosen to reinterpret the likes of Liang Qi Chao, whom you see in the top right, Wu Jianren, Guo Song Tao on the bottom left, uh, right, Chiu Jing in the middle in cross dress, these are well-known intellectuals of the uh, late Qing. I've chosen to reinterpret them and recast them as witnesses to new media technologies of their time with the hope that such re-evaluations of their recordings, transmissions, and self-writings, in short, their attempt to interconnect may surprise or even contradict some of their very well-known views on Westernization, nationalism, semi-colonialism and gender and class. If the result is that media uproot these well-known intellectuals and writers to a field of study seen as removed from their historical context, such a removal again envisages the lack of mediation between literature, culture, politics, and science and technology between what could be seen as amateurish Chinese thinkers and celebrated European and American mentors. And if the present project succeeds in bridging these boundaries or divisions, and if I succeed in extending media theory 
to questions of sociality and governance outside of Europe and America, the credit falls once again on the historical mediators, shuttling back and forth between technical devices and the discursive processes of their signification. Throughout this project, I found myself trying to uh, search for a different understanding of the political, not because nation building and the search for the perfect citizen are uninteresting and unimportant, but because these issues have precisely appropriated other mediums, both figurative and literal, technical and political to achieve their ends. Until we understand the complex interplays between the signified forms of media and their physical material forms, starting with a deceptively question, simple question of what it is that media do, the work of mediation, I argue, will continue to be uneven and unjustly distributed. So the first project, again, started with the deceptively simple question of what it is that media do. And I ended years of writing and rewriting by realizing I was really concerned with the political economy or the actual labor of mediation. And I bring out these two images because on one side you have the book cover and um, on the other is uh, my current desktop image, is, which is one of the most, um, it was one of the most active mines uh, in Northwestern China that really have mined or produced the rare earth minerals that, um, as you know, go, uh, go into our gadgets and smartphones. The mine itself is um, now inactive and you can even go see it. And I was stuck by the kind of abstraction of these two images. So for the second project, I want to ask why is it that Chinese digital media today, moving the timeline to the now, continue to have particular trouble representing modes of production? Why is it that instead of concrete scenes of labor, we get abstract images. And I suspect this has something to do with the persisting tensions between information work and more traditional forms of labor, but also a recursive logic between visibility and invisibility, between knowing and doing, and between um, new digital media scholarship and more traditional forms of um, ethnography. As with the stone and the wireless, I'm now interested in pursuing alternative inflections of the political when the various subjectivities at stake become the physical means and material mediums through which the political is reimagined and yet continue to be obscured or abstracted. Thank you. Thank you, Xiao. That was, that was excellent and pro provocative and fascinating. Thank um, you. So we have a question, um, if you're willing, we have some questions in the Q&A box. Um, we have one from Peter Zaro, um, who says, thank you for an interesting talk. When I think of new media in the late Qing, I think of daily newspapers and monthly magazines. These also used new physical technologies of printing, as well as increasingly relying on, for example, telegraphy. Can you say something about the role of this print culture in uh, mediation in the late Qing. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Professor Zara, your, your, your work has also been hugely um, helpful, influential throughout the process. And definitely print culture and lithography are indispensable sources in my study, along with monthlies and um, and other hybrid forms, as you mentioned. So uh, printing and telegraphy really were kind of working in tandem, especially during the 1900 Boxer Rebellion, where the court officials really relied on transfer telegrams um, throughout the region, right, to communicate. So telegrams will be reprinted and then sometimes sent again via telegram uh, and then physically carried by uh, men on horses to areas where there's uh, bombardments. So that is the kind of fundamental uh, print is fundamental to how newer technologies were recorded. So in a way, they are both my source because I'm not reading off um, actual telegrams, right? I'm reading 
the reprints or reprints of reprints. Um, likewise with photography and other interesting forms of even older media that are being reimagined. I'm reading them off print. So print becomes both a kind of um, the historical development of the time, but also my source and how print then engage with um, these newer forms from transmission is at the heart of the book. And um, definitely, yeah, definitely something I think through a lot. So I benefited so much from this existing scholarship on um, lithography houses and of course, you know, houses like Dian Shi Jai and illustrations as well. So thank you. Um, let's see, while we wait for other questions, um, I had a question if that's all right. Yeah. Taking telegraphy, for example, um, as a case, um, you mentioned how you offered a different understanding of media as not just the technology or it's how it's registered in discourse, but media itself mediates between those realms, but also East and West, uh, China and the West and so on and so forth. So what, among other things, media mediates all of these other things mm -hmm. uh, or realms or um, what have you. I guess my question is, did it also, I mean, if you think about the way the telegraph was received in say Europe, the UK and the United States, it was attended by all sorts of ideas about instantaneous communication, um, all sorts of new possibilities. Um, was that also discursively represented or registered um, in, in late Qing China as well? This kind of cultural widespread discourse of, of, of social change and progress and um, faster connections. Yeah, definitely. Um, the most kind of talked about impact or more kind of social cultural impact that telegraphy brought was on spiritualism and also feng shui. Mm. So the idea that the telegraph poles and wires were physically disrupting the kind of order of the land and the kind of uh, the, 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 the geomancy with which you know, ancestral ancestors are buried, for example, were very much um, discussed at that time. Although now with more research, scholars are also finding that officials were often exaggerating the, the unhappiness that these um, disruptions were bringing supposedly in for the, on the commoners because they wanted to actually um, stop the foreign companies from their monopoly on extending the network so that they could then get in into the profit of the whole commercial enterprise, right? So on the one hand, we have a lot of reports of um, people being unhappy with the telegraph poles. And on the other hand, it actually turned out to be a lot of corrupt uh, local officials exaggerating those unhappiness. But you can see from either side that uh, besides the kind of commercial revenues that the telegraphy was um, introducing, the cause for spiritual disorder was definitely similar to what you read in um, scholarship on the concurrent development in Europe and North America. And for, for my book, I was especially devoting one chapter to the boxes because they were um, so adamantly involved in pushing back against Western aggression and the symbol for that aggression was the telegraph and the railway, right? The two in tandem. And so much kind of reports. And again, focusing on the kind of uh, discursive images, again, circulated in international press, right? Journals around the time of Chinese boxes in their outfits, pulling out railway tracks and also uh, pulling out telegraph lines. And in response, they're saying that these are definitely polluting Chinese spirituality. So there is a lot of, um, again, association of, of what technologies could do in terms of connectivity, but also in terms of 
again, a Western threat to Chinese spirituality, for sure. Thank you. Um, we have another question from the audience. Um, the question goes like this. I'm, I'm interested in the role that Qing government plays in the emergence of new media. Could you say more about that? Also, was media being used in promoting Manchu cultures or in the same vein, anti-Manchuism movements and thoughts? In mm. short, what's the relationship between politics and media? Great question. Yeah, big one. Um, the Qing government was most prominently involved in the commercialization of telegraphy insofar as they were part of the um, part, part state and part commercial enterprise that was going on in the, in the years leading up to uh, the Boxer Rebellion. After the Boxer indemnity, they handed over the telegraph network, for instance, to the Western powers. And that wasn't kind of taken back from the allied powers till about almost two years after. And even then the telecommunications network continued to be part government and part private enterprise. So there was a interesting kind of uh, hybrid um, initiative going on in the late chain, which kind of still has resonance today, right? With, um, with businesses in contemporary China. So that is the most, um, immediate aspect of their role in terms of telegraphy and in terms of print houses and uh, popular press periodicals they did not have a lot of control or say even though in terms of censorship they were possible it is possible to not uh, disseminate a, a, a particular issue of a popular press for instance and this was, of course, the height of media innovations, but also the height of political sensitivities with the 1898, you know, um, political reform, the 100 days reform that uh, fell through, but also with all these different um, upheavals like the Boxer Rebellion domestically and also internationally with the uh, Sino-Soviet, I'm sorry, Sino-Japanese wars. So, in that sense, media was not used so much to promote Manchu culture as it was for um, a really burgeoning kind of commercial enterprise and um, as a way of simply controlling the movement of uh, information and messages during a kind of communication blockage like the Boxer Rebellion. So I would not say there was an intense um, mastery over using media to promote Manchu culture. And the limits of my research, however, means that I was not looking at so much of maybe other um, non-coastal regions where anti-Manchuism um, and pro-Manchuism could be more fertile or valid. So yeah, so in terms of kind of um, the, the area of ethnography, uh, of sorry, ethnicity and race, I'm not sure how much of media was used to promote that um, because I got a sense that the government was trying to maintain its foothold more in the commercial side of media and less so in kind of um, controlling its, um, kind of um, how propaganda could be spread, if that makes sense. Yeah, but it's not to say that there is no tight relationship between politics and media, of course. To just give you another example, the um, uh, Cixi, the Dowager, wanted to depose of Guang, the Guangxi Emperor uh, in 1900, right before the Boxer Rebellion happened and news of her aim to dispose of him and bring up another kind of prince under her wing really spread to overseas Chinese communities via telegrams and also telegram reprints 
in newspapers. So the spread was so, uh, you know, it spread to Singapore and Malaysia, and I looked at Singapore and Malaysia newspapers, but also Chinese newspapers in Thailand, in Cambodia, and in North America to a limited extent, who publicized uh, what the Empress was trying to do. And in turn, the, the kind of um, backlash was so intense that she actually stepped down from her initiative to depose of the current emperor. So in that sense, she could not be, the court could not be unaware of the fact that information could travel so rapidly in the time of um, print journalism and the telegraph. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Elizabeth, who we met. Um, the question is, I'm really struck by the idea of the historical actors in the book being themselves media theorists um, avant la lettre. I'm wondering if there was a dominant theory of media among those actors, or if there was a significant variety among them. Is it possible to give a brief description of what some of their theories were? Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, I, I like thinking of them as um, media theorists and put them on par with the, of course, the other theorists I look at throughout the book. They do not have, the Lei Qing men and women did not have a concise theory of mediation. And I think that's precisely what make the period and their work so engaging. But of course the process was, you know, hair pulling to say the least. They do not have a theory of media because they did not have a concept of media as such, but they were struggling with such intense divisions between what technologies meant and what the social and the political meant that by through their kind of dis discussions and debates, um, uh, uh, even richer theory of mediation was emerging. So one that we have to piece together really through, and of course a lot of translation work and a lot of you know attention to historical difference. But I think that's the kind of the biggest reward, if anything, of writing this book was to um, try to piece these things together. And of course, with the help of a lot of existing contemporary media theory. Thanks. I, I had a sort of related question, which is, so the media theorists or the mediators, as you called them, um, there you showed how they anticipate contemporary kind of canonical, maybe Western media theorists of today or 20, late 20th century. But could you say how this particular kind of vernacular media theory before the media concept at this in this period in China, how that shapes um, media theory today in China. Did this tradition, did this kind of fertile thinking before the media concept lead mm. to a particular brand of media theory in, in today in contemporary China? That's a great question. That's definitely the second project. Um, yeah, I think how it does shape the contemporary scene, at least how I look at it from my vantage point, is the, the continue to measure, or at least the late chain continues to offer a lesson on um, a, a lot of things. The, the kind of distance between thinking through the means and relationship in philosophy or in theory, right? Um, something which has kind of, you know, fallen out of fashion. I mean, to think about means and end, or rather it's something perhaps still used in ethical, in ethics, which is really not my field. But if you think about means end as also the instrument versus the goal and the medium versus the message, you can think about a lot of corresponding binaries, right? And I think, what the Lei Qing does for me in thinking about the contemporary scene is the kind of um, what gets thrown under the bus, as it were, right? So, for example, the, the female body that is um, often exploited 
to in even contemporary Chinese science fiction to reimagine a kind of uh, to even critique uh, China's kind of technocratic capitalism, you still have very progressive science fictional works that exploit the female body as a means for a kind of um, to build the sci-fi universe, right? So in my conclusion, for example, I uh, discussed this great contemporary Chinese sci-fi writer whose work, you know, just published a few years ago and how his critique of, you know, China's uh, ecological destruction and capitalist ways were really founded on this exploit of the female media, right? And so the female medium is of course something, a figure whom media scholars um, globally have talked about because the femininity has been so crucial for early, you know, uh, media technologies, but also today, right, in the cyberpunk, post-cyberpunk tradition. So that's one instance where I think thinking through the kind of what I call the unequal work of mediation um, gets carried on to the present age. And that's for a kind of fictional representation. But I'm also thinking, for example, how, and this really just occurred to me while preparing for this talk. So this distance between you know, discursive representations of media and um, the kind of um, hard and concrete uh, device or communicative process that I've been tracking throughout the book is that distance getting wider and wider because the labor that gets into um, these mediatory processes are really unseen. And I think, you know, I'm not an economic historian, but um, late Qing intellectual history has often be self conscious of its. Um, inadequate attention to more um, common or more indigenous forms of intellectual thought, right? And focusing on the kind of um, more coastal area and elite um, institutions for obvious reasons. And I, I really am also uh, self-conscious of the kind of elitism of my own media theorist and and how I can kind of continue the work of media or mediation in contemporary China by looking at more, um, yeah, more popular usage, as it were. Yeah, so that's a very rambling answer to your question. No, speculative and gesturing toward your second book, which, which is great. So maybe we'll make this the last question. It's also from Peter Zaro. Um, his question is, following up on Elizabeth's question, I was interested in your reference to interconnectedness. Yeah. And there's the character for that um, term, which I associate with Tan Sitong. I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, um, which I associate with Tan Sitong, especially pending my reading of your book. Can I ask if you might see Tan's attempts to create a new philosophy of benevolence as a reflection of his thinking about new media. Yeah, thanks again for the question. So this actually dovetails too with uh, one of your question, Yohei, um, about the kind of uh, cultural intellectual impact of new media. So Tang Sitong, and in his uh, work, uh, Ren Xue, uh, which I talk about in chapter five, really was prominent, was really remarkably bringing together electricity and also the American kind of mind thought movement that is associated with American spiritualism or rather kind of a offshoot of spiritualism into his, his work. And Tan Sutong was a, one of the martyrs of the 100 Days Reform and so a very prominent um, patriot and intellectual who died very young. But this idea of philosophy of benevolence was to bring together all these different ideas of connectivity and therefore extend a kind of ethics that is um, truly kind of all penetrating, right? So I examine passages from his philosophy where he talks about how electricity of the body and, and 
thoughts from the brain could emit and connect together and in turn they will infuse you know different citizens of course his ultimate game was also besides a kind of a way of living was also to kind of uh, uh, unite um, unite the different citizens of China right in what he sees as uh, what he saw as a crisis of the time so his mentioning of electricity is extremely intriguing likewise Tang's use of the brain as a central seat of power that was also something that biomedically was gaining a lot of prominence in the late Qing so you actually have uh, for example a popular entrepreneur of the time in the early 20th century um, having all these um, advertisements on late Qing periodicals promoting his kind of brain medicine that once every single China man who take the medicine will kind of interconnect with each other and therefore build up a strong China, right? So you have actually these kind of, um, basically they're selling fake medicine and, but they're really borrowing a lot of then popular scientific knowledge of the brain and nerves and how nerves could connect different parts of the human body and by extension, different parts of the nation. So yeah, and this idea of connectedness really went you know, to literally cosmic register in science fiction of the time. So in connection with Tang Tong, I discuss um, uh, new tales of Mr. Bragadasio, which is an early proto science fiction that also talk about the brain in a kind of a connected way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm feeling like I need some brain medicine myself. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much, Xiao, um, for this wonderful talk. Um, and I'm really looking forward to reading your your monograph. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for this opportunity.